it is a huge honor for me to be doing my first podcast with uh, the first dentist from Jordan I've ever had the honor to podcast, uh, Dr. Thamer Thiem. Um, I've heard about you in so many places. Uh, you were part of the Baird Group. I mean, I see you all over social media, Facebook. I mean, you're a, you're a rock star, buddy. And it was a uh, it was an honor that you would give me an hour of your time. It's uh, 12 o'clock noon. I'm on my lunch hour in Phoenix. What time is it in Amman, Jordan? Actually, it's it's 10 in the evening. 10 in the evening. So you're 10 hours yeah. ahead. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on today. And um, my pleasure. Now, your what would you say your your main focus is? Cosmetic dentistry. Yes, exactly. And and how did you get interested in cosmetic dentistry? And and how was that? Uh, how was that market in Amman, Jordan? Actually, to be honest, this is a funny story. In uh, my early career, I was some kind of a lost dentist. Uh, I practiced uh, endodontics, periodontics, implantology, like anyone else. You know, uh, and many times I tried to switch my career, even to quit dentistry. You know, because it's for a fresh graduates, it's frustrating, uh, frustrating, it's uh, very difficult. So I thought of becoming a pilot, uh, then I thought of becoming a singer, okay. Then somehow I found myself into cosmetic dentistry. It's, you know, creating smiles for the people, you see the effect you create, how you change their lives, uh, the effect you create on a daily basis, how you change their lives, how you change the, the way they look to themselves. Actually, here where I found myself and that's what the start. Well, I think one of the keys to happiness is always, um, you know, do what you love. Exactly. And if you do what you love, you'll do it a lot. And after about 10,000 hours, which takes about 10 years, you'll be a rock star at it. And uh, trading time for money, doing something you hate to get money is going to lead to disease, depression, drinking, escaping, weird behavior. And uh, I feel so fortunate that at 52 years, I don't think I've ever given anyone a day in my life uh, for money. I mean, I just, I just, I just loved it. That's it. That's it. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so about uh, we, we get about five to six thousand uh, views alone on this each uh, episode on iTunes, and then uh, there's Dental Town and YouTube. Um, but about eighty percent of them are Americans, and uh, so first thing Americans are probably thinking is, uh, you're in Jordan. How many dentists are in Jordan? <laughs> Actually, we have around 8,000. 8,000? And what would be the population? Uh, about 7 to 8 million, I think. 7 8 million? Maybe. And I'm, yes. and I'm just curious, um, you're a worldly man. Uh, what do you think, uh, Americans are probably wondering, what's it like practicing dentistry in Jordan? I mean, is insurance a big part of the equation? Is insurance from government or private sector? Or is there basically not dental insurance? Is mostly just pay your own cash? Uh, actually, surprisingly, it's, it's the same. It's the same. And we have insurances, we have private practice, we have governmental uh, services. Uh, the only difference between uh, us and the American dentist is the price. We have the same materials, the same equipments, uh, the same. We do the same procedures, uh, the same technology. We are we are up to date. We have everything we need. But you know, because of the taxes and maybe a little bit the costs are a little bit reduced here in Jordan or in the Middle East in general. So I think we provide the same service with, to some extent, with, uh, for a lesser amount of money. So now if you have a license to practice dentistry in Jordan, um, do you also, does that, do you get a practice in other countries nearby you? Because I think I've seen you uh, and some of your posts practicing in uh, Saudi Arabia or London with the, uh, the, the Baird Group. Uh, what what uh, do other countries recognize your license, or do you have to go country by country? Uh, actually, it's you have to go a country by country. But uh, most of the time in the region, which is the Middle East and North Africa, the procedure is simple. It's do to do some sort of examination, uh, maybe an interview, and, and that's it. And you can get it easily. Uh, you don't need to uh, to study or just an exam or an interview. Is the, exam, is the exam written or do you have to do a live board patient? Do you have to do procedures online? Uh, sometimes both of them. It, it, it depends on the country. Huh. So, um, so that, that is interesting. I, I, I cannot wait to visit your country someday. My goal 
is the luxury. Pleasure, it's, it's, it's a lovely place. You have my, my goal, my bucket list, my main vice is I love, I love lecturing in other countries of dentists because if you go to another country as a tourist, uh, you, you know, you're going to stay in a hotel like in the United States and you're going to do some tourist traps. What's really fun is to go to another country to go lecture because then real dentists pick you up. Uh, you get to see the country with, for, with from your friend's point of view, and, and I, I just love it. So hopefully uh, I'll get a lecture there someday and meet you in person. Hopefully, hopefully soon, uh, Howard. When you, we are on it. We, uh, I think we are in the process of associating with the, some academias, uh, some academics, uh, and uh, maybe with the dental town also uh, to organize courses between the Middle East and uh, the U.S. also. So now I um, I associate you and first heard of you um, through the Baird Academy. Uh, yes. Explain to our viewers uh, that that that's a big thing in London. I don't know if uh, probably half of our viewers have never heard of it. Explain the Baird Academy in London and how did you get involved with that and what's all that about? Okay, uh, Baird stands for the British Academy of Implant and Restorative Dentistry. It started. Uh, almost five years back by uh, Professor Marcus Pizzito and Dr. Hassan Maghair in Leeds, in England. Uh, when they started the idea of establishing an, a new academy, they asked themselves, uh, what's the new we are going to provide? What's the new about it? So we focused uh, and we searched what we have, the courses everywhere, the dental education. It's almost the same everywhere. So our original idea was to establish dental education on an evidence-based dentistry. We will provide uh, continuing education, postgraduate education, but conditioned by it should be an evidence-based knowledge. This is the idea of PAIRD. So they start in England bringing this idea uh, we are based in Leeds, but because we have a huge demand for dental education in the Middle East, in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia, in the Gulf region, so uh, we established many, many courses in many different countries in, in this region, in a specific. And, and um, what is, um, you said there's 8,000 dentists in Jordan. Of those 8,000, how many of them place dental implants? Maybe... Uh, it's roughly speaking a uh, thousand, thousand and a half. Thousand, one, one in eight? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing how some countries like the United States, 95% uh, of general dentists have never placed an implant. But in countries like Korea, Germany, Italy, three out of four dentists place implants. Yeah, surprisingly, I don't know, maybe the people here are, uh, you, you know, I think in, in the U.S., uh, maybe the career is a little bit more controlled. You have more restrictions. You have uh, insurance you have to pay. Uh, you have uh, maybe a different style of practice. But here is, the market is open. Anyone can learn. The restrictions are much uh, lower than that in the U.S., okay? So it's, I think it's easier for general dentists to practice and to learn uh, implants, and we can start placing implants the, the next day. I think it has advantages and disadvantages. It's not always advantages to have, you know, just get the course and place implants immediately. So this is the idea of we need more education, more dental courses, and we have to, more, to work harder on that. So in Jordan, are you allowed to advertise your services? Some countries, like Hong Kong, say no advertising. Other countries... It's pretty wide open. What's it like in Jordan? Actually, it's, it's uh, an interesting question. Uh, in Jordan, it's prohibited, okay? But uh, we, we, we found a, a, a space uh, in advertising through the social media, through the e-marketing, let's call it. So, so you're, not allowed, low, you're not allowed to do yeah. print marketing or, or mailing or... Well, what do, you, what do you not allow? So you're allowed to do digital marketing on Facebook and Twitter and Google. Exactly, but it's not, uh, let's call it, it's not a proper marketing. You know, uh, for example, I have a Facebook page. I have uh, more than two millions uh, of followers all around the region. Two million? 
Yeah. Oh my um, god. <laughs> two million? See, I said yeah. you're a rock star right out of the gate. You have two million. <laughs> sort of. That, that, I mean, so, that is amazing. Yeah, it took us uh, maybe five years to get that number for the whole region, it's not only from Jordan. We have it from the North Africa, from uh, Middle East, some European countries, uh, even uh, uh, some in, in the U.S., they are following us because uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they opened a spaces that never existed before. So I think this is the main source of marketing for us nowadays. And it's, it's not that controlled, actually. And what, what specific times of advertising are illegal? Are you talking about uh, mailing a flyer or a sign outside your building? What, what, what can you not do? Actually, uh, you cannot advertise in TV, in the newspapers, in uh, magazines. Uh, you cannot have, a, let's call it, a proper ad. You know, when uh, this is my clinic, this is, you are allowed to advertise yourself the first time you open your practice. It's only allowed for once. A notice. Yeah. So, so I will. So I, I, I'm 52 years old. I was born in 62. How old are you and what year were you born? Actually, I'm uh, 33 years old. What, so what year are you born? 83. 83? That's interesting yeah. because it was that way in the United States until 1973. And it was actually, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. It's actually two attorneys in Tucson, Arizona who um, were lawyers, where lawyers could advertise anywhere, and they took it all the way to the Supreme Court and said um, that it violates free speech. And so the United States was like that way till 1973. But what's funny is I got out of school in 87, and when I started doing advertising, when I was uh, 24, all the older guys that were my age, oh, my God, they, they, they thought it was just horrible and I was demeaning the profession, and, and uh, they just kept scolding me. But the problem was I, I was getting 100 new patients a month from it, and the cash was – and the patient flow was just so awesome. So the, the only point I make that point to you is uh, it's that way in Jordan in 2015, it's, but it's it, can, exactly it can change tomorrow. Actually, we are working on it. Uh, it's exactly the same. Uh, the people are afraid of, of the career being more uh, – of a business than it's a, a medicine, okay? Uh, they, they, they are afraid that the dentist will focus on uh, just the business part of it, and they thought all about the what we are learned to be the ethics of the of the ethics of dentistry. So this is our uh, main fear, our, our main fear. Uh, <laughs> but I think we are going there. We are going there. The idea is media sometimes is uh, misleading. You know, uh, even for the patients nowadays, because the, uh, the market is more open, uh, the country is free, you can advertise whatever you want. So the people, the patients, they just uh, hear, hear and listen about different, different names of the same treatment with different uh, prices, for example. For example, some, some of my patients, they come ask for Hollywood Smile and New York Smile and Designer Smile and... Uh, Lumineers or uh, Glam Smile, and for God's sake, it's, it's all it's all dental veneers, you know. So, I think it's it's not good to be that open, but it has, as anything else, it's had some advantages and disadvantages. So, tell me this: <clears throat> when you're in, like, say, England, um, the people when you're talk when you're staying in England, you're talking to uh, non dentists at hotels and restaurants and bars and all that stuff, and you say, well, what do you think about American teeth? They just start laughing and say, ah, they're too white, and you bleach them too white, and you guys look like clowns. And in a lot of countries, a lot of countries, they don't want to have an American smile because it's just too, it's just too white, it's too bright, it's too in your face. Um, what does Jordan and, and surrounding Middle East, North African countries think of uh, an American white smile, veneers, ear to ear, and all that stuff? Man, you are invading the world. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You know, uh, even supreme white, snow white colors, they are not satisfactory for our patients. This is not white. I need whiter. So they just want white, 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 white. It's crazy. Uh, sometimes 
I tell them what you see in TV because of the flashes, the lightning they have, uh, your teeth are whiter than Kim Kardashian, for example, you know? <laughs> but they still insist, no, I need whiter. I saw whiter on TV, on television. Uh, I think you are controlling the way. <laughs> I, think, I think Kim Kardashian, everybody makes fun of her, but I think she's a lesson for every dentist. I'd like to podcast and interview her because she's the first person who's famous just for being famous. I mean, she never did a single thing except market herself. She has no resume, no credentials, no accomplishments, and she's a household name from Kansas exactly. to Kathmandu, from Phoenix to Jordan, and she hadn't done anything. If every dentist could just be a little Kim Kardashian to get their message out, um, because that's what dentistry has to do, um, because the consumers are going to spend all the money they get and all they can put on their credit cards and all they can borrow. Every earthling is going to spend more than they'll ever make in their life and die in debt. Our goal is to make them um, spend their money on dentistry and keep their human body healthy. And so they spend less on Coke and cookies and chocolates and trips to Disneyland and uh, music downloads on iTunes and, you know. Howard, it's all about this, you know. Uh, and actually, this is uh, what I tell my students. Uh, you have to put yourself in focus. Okay, advertise yourself, uh, put your work, advertise your work. This will keep you insisting in providing the best quality you ever, uh, you, you, you can have. Uh, so you, you will keep learning, you will keep, uh, try to get the best you can offer. Uh, I think putting yourself in this field, in front of the people, uh, try to market yourself and and you have to believe in the power of each one of us. I, I believed in myself. I thought, okay, I can, I can make it. I can be a rock star. I can, I can do whatever I want. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not less than, than anyone else. So I have to believe in this and just to, work, to find a way to work it out. So, Thaber, you said you were 32? How old yes. did you say? 30? 30, you're th 33. Okay, you said you're 33. When I go around to countries, like say, um, say uh, Kathmandu, Nepal, I hear older dentists saying that when they were uh, just out of school in their 20s, um, everyone drank water and it was extremely common for a six-year-old kid to come in and never had a cavity in their life. And then from over the last 20, 30 years, uh, they switched from drinking water to drinking Coke and Pepsi. And now a kid has a cavity almost for every year old he is. So a six-year-old probably walks in with six cavities, a 10-year-old with 10 cavities. Um, what is that like in Jordan? Um, has Jordan switched from drinking water to drinking soda? When you talk to older dentists who are my age, do they say, um, hey, Thamer, I mean, you know, there's twice as much cavities in kids today than it was 25 five years ago, or are you not really hearing that? What, what is the diet like in Jordan? It's, it's exactly the same, uh, Howard. It's uh, fast food, uh, fuzzy drinks, uh, it's exactly the same. Uh, but maybe because of the education nowadays, uh, people are somehow, they go to uh, be the dentist, they ch uh, check their teeth on their teeth on early stages, in early, in early, in, on early age. So uh, I think we have better health standards, okay? But the problems, the, the dental problems are still increasing. And do they use uh, fluoridated water in Jordan or? Yes, yes. So they fluoridate the water? Yes. Is, is that common in the Middle East to fluoridate water? Like is Cairo fluoridated or Riyadh, yes. Saudi Arabia or? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's common. It's, uh, I, I think most of the countries, they do it uh, nowadays. Um, speaking of marketing, you know what I wish you would help me do? I think, um, I think a lot of the Bear Institute people over in London, I mean, London is London's arguably probably the most international city in the world. I mean, yeah. the British Empire sure. used to, you know, they you had flags in 68 countries. And uh, I don't think a lot of them over in London realize that uh, Dental Town has 200,000 registered dentists on it, and I think the best marketing they could do is um, is put some of their courses on Dental Town just to expose people to the bear. Yeah, yeah. Howard, what you are doing is, is amazing. You, you know, uh, you are sitting here and you're uh, chatting with someone in 
in different uh, country, you, you are bridging the gap between dentists, you are uh, uh, bringing the dentists closer, so this is amazing. Uh, and uh, what you are doing in dental town, it's, it's, it's lovely, it's, uh, I, I think we should bring, uh, we, sh we should work this closer and work harder on it, we have to. I mean, I would like to make uh, some of you Baird instructors a household name with the 150,000 American dentists because uh, some, some of the material you have is just amazing. And let's let's go through that. What what do you uh um what what is the main thing you're teaching at Baird Academy? Uh, we have uh, we have sort of uh, we have short courses and long courses. We focus mainly on implants, implant dentistry, and uh, on the other hand, we. We focus on restorative and aesthetic dentistry. Okay, so let's so uh, let, let's go. Let, I'm going to try to nail you down on some specifics. Uh, um, so you're so the people listening to you is most likely going to be five to six thousand, and 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 eighty percent of those are American. Twenty percent is about 150 other countries, and in this American market, 95 out of 100. Uh, General dentists have never placed one implant. So they're driving to work right now. They're listening to you on their, uh, their iTunes and they're uh, Bluetoothing it into their car. And they're listening to you and they're saying, okay, let's get specifics. When I go to the dental convention and, um, and the IDS meeting in Cologne, Germany every two years, that's the biggest dental meeting in the world, 100,000 dentists show up. There were 145 different implant companies. How, how does an individual dentist pick between 145 different implants when they're all made out of titanium. So how would you answer that? What, what's the, and and I, I always try to estimate questions that the, that the listeners are saying. And the listeners are probably saying, well, ask Damer, what, what system does he use and why? Actually, uh, there are many factors that, that, affect, uh, that can interfere here. Uh, first of all, uh, the services, the, uh, you have... You have to work with the strong companies so they can, uh, you can be comfortable using their products. So the name of, of the company is it's, it's of, of real importance, of course. Uh, for example, it's easier uh, not to start with uh, new companies. Uh, they just, uh, a new household, you know, you have to start with, uh, maybe original uh, implant companies. Okay, this is important. And the second, is, uh, the second thing is how easy is that system? I think for a beginner, those things that uh, any he or she should focus on: how strong is this company, and how, on the other hand, how easy is that implant system to start practicing implant dentistry. And what system do you use in? Amon Jordan, and what system does the Baird Institute um, use in their training courses? Actually, uh, Baird, uh, we don't focus on a specific system uh, because our uh, idea or our uh, thinking, uh, our thoughts is uh, to uh, advertise evidence-based uh, practice, not to focus on a specific implant system or a specific company. We are open to all the systems. We, we, any, we make some. We, we make sort of collaboration sometime from from time to time between with different companies. But it's not our uh, real thing. Our real thing is to uh, to learn to teach uh, evidence based uh, implant dentistry, not to sell uh, implant systems. And what 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 evidence do you think that you focus on? that these younger dentists should be focused on? I mean, when you say that you, you like to focus on the evidence, what, what evidence are you looking at that, that's making you do certain clinical decisions? Do you have any? Yes. For example, uh, how many studies uh, this, this implant system uh, they did, for, for example, to start with. I'm talking about the young dentist in specific. I'm, I'm still a beginner, and I want to start practicing implant dentistry. So... Uh, is this company, they, did they do any research? Did they have any articles? Uh, are those are, are random-based trials or, or just uh, case reports? So what are the studies they are conducting? So I, I think working with uh, companies that focus on the scientific part, it, it will help a lot. 
And and do you think the um, the average dentist who goes to uh, a Baird course or or gets an implants like in the United States, um, ninety five out of a hundred crowns are done one tooth at a time. A patient just comes in, one broken tooth gets fixed, and ninety five out of a hundred implants placed are just to replace one missing tooth. I think when I look at the press and the cases and Cases on Facebook, it's always that 5%, it's a full mouth, it's a roundhouse, it, you know, it's all that. But the reality is 95% of the market is one tooth dentistry. And my question to you is, I want you to weigh in on a huge controversy in the United States, and that is, if a dentist is getting into implantology, um, some people say, well, get a CBCT and get a surgical guide because you can snap that thing into place and basically anybody could drill a hole through the, the guiding tube and place the implant. And then the older guys like are like my age or uh, maybe oral surgeons and periodontists who have placed thousands of implants, maybe ten to 30,000 implants will say to me, hey, that's uh, that's like putting training wheels on a bicycle. That's like that's like a three-wheeler. You need to be a real surgeon. And we're talking about a single-place implant. Um, you got a tooth in front, a tooth in back. You should lay a flap, look at the bone, be a real surgeon. So my question to you is, if if, if this uh, woman dentist is listening to you on the way to work right now and she wants to place her first implant, would you recommend that she did it with training wheels and a surgical guide? Or would you recommend her just to suck up buttercup and lay a flap, look at the bone, and be a surgeon? Uh, this is a real controversy. Actually, Howard, it's, uh, I don't think, uh, I, I think every implant practitioner, they should have the basic knowledge, okay, to be, a, let's call it a, a small surgeon, okay? They have, uh, implant dentistry is a general practice. It's not only for uh, dental surgeons or prosthodontists or periodontists. Nowadays, we have universities that they, uh, teach their students to place implants in the pre-graduate school. So uh, we cannot say that implants should be done only uh, for uh, surgeons or periodontics or uh, periodontists or, uh, or prosto. No, any, gen any general dental practitioner with, uh, with uh, in the minimum knowledge possible, he can place implants. It's it is the standard uh, of care that he should do the CBCT, the uh, surgical guide, maybe the prosthetic guide. But uh, I think there is a minimum of surgical uh, expertise. They should exist before placing an implant. So it's, we can say, it's okay, it's a general practice. Any general dentist can place an implant, okay? But there is... Okay, nowadays the, the practice is much easier. We have the technology is helping us a lot, but still there is a little, there is a need for a basic surgical skills to place implants properly. You know, you cannot do the job only by having a CBCT or a, a surgical guide. It's not that uh, simple. What percent of the cases in your practice that when you place the implant, do you personally use a surgical guide? Actually, I'm, I'm more into the, uh, in this, maybe 35%. 35%, and would that be more likely to use a surgical guide for a single tooth implant or for multiple implants? For multiple implants. So you, uh, would you say that you only use surgical guides for multiple implants and you almost never use one for a single? Actually, uh, for a, you know, for every case, it's different, okay? But right. mainly when we have a suspicion about the bone quality, the bone graft, the angulation of the implants. So here we call for a surgical uh, guide. I think it is the standard of care to have a surgical guide for every procedure. But, you know, not all of the patients, they can afford this. Uh, it's, not, it's not always uh, affordable. So I think sometimes we kind of skip it. It is the standard of care, but... Uh, at some point, you have to use it. And, to, and how do you uh, make your surgical guide? Do you, do you make it off the, uh, the CBC file and exporting the data for models? Do you, do you make it off the CBCT, or do you take impressions of the, uh, in the mouth and make it on a model? Actually, uh, both of them. Nowadays, we have uh, companies like Simplants, like uh, 3D Plan Master, 
uh, we do impressions, we do prosthetic guide, and uh, sometimes we combine both of them. We, we do both. So tell, um, so tell our listeners uh, something you think they might not know or something they should focus on to help them in their implant uh, placement. Actually, it's all about the knowledge, Howard. You know, uh, the more knowledge you get, okay, the more uh, confident you will be with yourself placing an implant. I always tell, uh, start with an easy system, okay, with an easy case. Okay, so start, take, a, take a, an easy implant system and take, a, take a, an easy case to start with uh, for someone uh, who's forgiving person. Okay, uh, and uh, once you place, for example, my first implant was for my mom. And my first well, sinus list was for a mother-in-law. <laughs> uh, so, once you place your first implant, I think uh, it's it's the beginning. It's the key. It's the knowledge. When you have the knowledge, you'll have the uh, confidence, and it it will tag along. Everything will tag along. Very good. And, uh, and when you, you said a, an easy case, you said an easy system, but you didn't name a system. You said an easy case and you didn't name a case. I assume you're saying an easy case would be, uh, you're, you're a cosmetic dentist, so something, nothing visible. You wouldn't want to place your exactly. first implant where someone could see it. Exactly. You'd want, it, you'd want yep. it to be about a second bicuspid uh, first exactly. molar. Yeah, good bone quality. On, on an yeah. old, ugly guy like me who cosmetics wouldn't no. matter? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I know I'd be the perfect cosmetic <laughs> patient because I don't show any teeth. Uh, but uh, so, so I'm going to switch to implants and cosmetics since that's obviously your expertise. I've seen a gazillion of your cases, and you are like Beethoven uh, with playing titanium. You really have amazing cases. I I look at so many of your cases and you just think, wow, that is truly remarkable, marvelous, wonderful. So give them some tips. Let's say someone's listening to you in the States and they've done 10 or 20 and they're thinking about uh, placing an implant. So let me give you a scenario. Uh, a good looking lady walks in your office and she's 50 years old. She's got a high lip line and number uh, her front incisor had a root canal and a crown and broke, had perio, had to be extracted. How would you handle the tissue? Because that, that, that's the whole game up front. Because if you put an implant and she looks in the mirror and she sees some post coming out of her jaw and a, and a tooth on it, she's going to hate it. How, what, what t how do you handle that tissue uh, so that looks pleasant on a um, good-looking woman with a high lip line? Yes. Uh, for me, Howard, those are the most critical cases, okay? I, I always tell my students not to start uh, with these cases, except you are a real expert, okay? So those are our, let's call it a red line, okay? So once you are an expert, you can work on the uh, aesthetic zone. Uh, for me, you should prepare yourself for a, a bone graft and a soft tissue augmentation. I almost do that for 90% of the cases in the aesthetic zone. Okay, and walk, uh, walk us through that. What is your bone, how do you bone graft, and, and what did you say, and a soft tissue augmentation? Yes, connective tissue graft, uh, an alloderm sometimes. Can you, uh, can you kind of explain that procedure, how you do it? Which, which kind of procedure? The, how, how you're, how you're, what you do for a standard bone graft. What is your standard bone graft? I mean, how, how do you place it? I mean, are you using... Uh, uh, I, I use a, 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 a synthetic bone graft. Okay, I use a synthetic bone graft. I usually, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's totally dependent on the socket type. Okay, how, gonna, how we are going to manipulate the socket, the amount of bone available. But most of the cases in the aesthetic zone, we find uh, ourselves uh, in need for, uh, uh, for placing uh, or augmenting the, the case with the synthetic bone and also augmenting the soft tissues. Okay, so you use synthetic bone, and, um, you know, I was taught, you know, I always try to use autogenous bone. Um, why do you like uh, synthetic bone instead of um, autogenous bone? The, the main reason is uh, because it's easier, okay? We, we do not uh, bring our patients to more, uh, to another surgery, to uh, more difficult procedures. Uh, I think uh, 
that's what we called it, the evidence-based practice. We, we, they did many studies uh, comparing autogenous uh, porn and the uh, uh, synthetic porn. I, 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 I don't want to generalize, but at the end, to some point, they can almost work the same. And what, what type of synthetic bone do you use? Do you have, is it a certain company? Um, is it a name yeah, brand? I, 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 yeah, you know, I, I use many uh, many types. The uh, yes, uh, I, I hear you talking about the Megagen uh, bone. It's it's very good. The uh, the Megagen uh, bone graft. The we use the bio os, the internal os. The it's it's to be honest, it's not that of a difference. The type of the synthetic bone. As long as it's it's a well established uh, company with a good reputation. At the end. To some extent, they almost work the same. So would you, on this 50-year-old lady, this case we're talking about, would you do the bone graft and then have her wear like a removable uh, partial flipper for a while while that heals? Or would you do all that bone graft and place the implant at the same time? Yeah, we, uh, uh, Howard, it's, it's, uh, of course it's a case dependent, but most of the time uh, uh, we believe that we should place a uh, if we have enough primary stability, we'll do uh, a, temp a, a, a sort of immediate uh, temporization, <laughs> maybe uh, a rochette. If we have enough primary stability, we can sometimes we, we immediately load the implant to establish the soft tissue profile. So, uh, no, we are not into flippers or removable uh, dentures, but uh, we always recommend to do uh, a rochette or a uh, an immediate temporary crown. It will, it will help a lot. Yeah, it depends on when you're placed the implant, you think it'll torque out and <clears throat> be stable enough. So what else did you want to talk about? What, what other cosmetic tips could the legend uh, share with our listeners? Um, um, are you doing, a, t let's talk about just the basic, basic, basic teeth bleaching, teeth whitening. Uh, are you a big fan uh, doing that in your office or do you just take impressions, make trays and have them do it at home? What's your, what's your standard go-to when a woman walks in and says, I want to bleach my teeth? Actually, Howard, before talking about bleaching, I think believing in the teamwork, it's, it's the key to success. For, for example, in, in, uh, in my practice, uh, we have a periodontist, we have an oral surgeon, I'm a prosthodontist. So uh, for every uh, single case, you will have three dentists working on the same, at least three dentists working on the same case. So uh, to start off for maybe this can apply for every type of dental procedures. It's, it's a teamwork. We don't have super dentists uh, anymore, okay? Uh, if you believe in this, I think this is the key start to, to success. It's the teamwork. Uh, for bleaching, you asked me about bleaching. I, I believe in doing this, both of them. But but what is your, what do you what do you like when someone comes into the off street? So a forty year old lady walks in and says, "Hey, I want to I want to white I want to bleach my teeth." What would be your go to? Would it be in office or would you send her home with trays? Actually, my protocol is to do both of them. Okay. Yeah, because uh, many of, most of the patients, I, I I think many dentists they think that uh, spending two hours bleaching the teeth in office. This will cost a lot of money, and uh, this is a sort of waste of time. And actually, this is not true, because uh, our today's patients they they want to see immediate effects. So this is what they cannot have using their home uh, bleaching trays only. So the uh, the wow effect they should get it in, into the clinic in the clinic. Okay, so it's very important that they that they go home with a white teeth. This is my philosophy, okay? And because patients, when, when they have their bleaching uh, on days or on weeks, they don't see the difference. Right. Yeah, so it's, uh, I think we should establish sort of a primary improvement in the office and to boost this up and to keep the result we advise them to use the home bleach. So I think this is my, I do almost three to four uh, cases a day for uh, bleaching. And I, I think this is my uh, tip. Uh, I do both office and home bleaching. Even sometimes I do the home bleaching for free, you know. 
I believe in it's 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 all about the home bleach. Right, and yeah. not the light. I mean, most yes. it's not the light. Of course, it's not the light. But do you even use the light? Yeah. Do you use the light on the patients? Yeah, they 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 just like it. I know. I I I. It's it's the only thing I feel I really don't feel right about. I mean, I kind of feel dirty because when they went to in office bleaching. And I know all the research says the light doesn't do anything, but yes. every time I say to the patient, well, we don't use the light because it's not necessary, they don't believe you. So now they're like, well, I don't know. I think I'm going to try this laser bleach. You know? So it's like I, I can't, I can't same, explicate yeah. 7 billion earthlings. So I just – we have the you – know, we do the light even though I believe that it has no impact. Actually, Howard, I always tell my patients before I start – you have to know three or four things about bleaching. First of all, we are dentists. We don't control the results. It's all about your teeth. No dentist can control the results of teeth whitening. Number two, most of the patients, they come with a very high expectations. I always tell them what you see on television, this is not bleaching, okay? And I always tell my patients, it's all about uh, your teeth, your oral habits, so it's, it's uh, reversible. So you have to keep doing this all over and all over again. So this is why I always emphasize after you do the office speech, you have to supplement it with an, an, an in-home kit. And um, let, let's go to uh, the anterior teeth. Do you ever do direct bonding um, for, to do a smile makeover or do you always prefer indirect porcelain veneers? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm more of an indirect person, you know. Uh, I think the culture and the community plays a role here. Okay, and nowadays we have uh, superior composites, we have uh, superior cases that are done with uh, direct restorations, direct bonding. But uh, I think m maybe it's, it's the case here in, in Jordan or the Middle East, but I think the hygiene, the habits... Uh, the composites are maybe not helping me regarding uh, uh, keeping the, the nice results they get uh, at the dental office. So I'm more into the uh, porcelain laminate veneers. I, 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 I still do direct bonding for some cases, but whenever I have the chance, I, no, I'll go for indirect restoration. And do you, do you make your own in your own dental office, your own lab, or do you send them out to a lab? Where, where do you send your veneers? Actually, I have uh, my in-office lab. You have an in-office lab, and how? Yes. Yeah, and that, that that must be really that must be a nice luxury. Yes. Yeah, it took me time too, but to be honest, for an aesthetic practice, you have to own this. You have to have your own lab for an aesthetic practice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and if, how many? How many? How many? Is that a one-man show, or does that take two people, three people? How many people does it take to have an in-office lab? Uh, actually, uh, to make it simple, you, at least you need a, you need a, a one lab, a lab material and one ceramist. So two people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, for me, uh, my ceramist has his own uh, laboratory. Okay, and for aesthetic cases, we have our own lab. When he come to the office and we start working in the patient, so it's not enough for the dentist only to to do the case all by himself. It's, it's very important. Again, it's, it's all about the teamwork. You know, it was, kind of, it was kind of interesting because when I got out of school in 1987, now it's 2015, so 28 years ago, all the dentists I knew where I lived in Kansas, they had a one man in a room about the size of a dental operatory, um, the same, same size room as a dental operatory, making all their crowns. But then um, these new systems started coming out like, that required big money to buy lots of big machines for Emacs and all these different machines. And it kind of priced them out of the market. And I, I think it was that high price machinery that kind of created a lot of the big labs. And now I don't, like, I don't know anybody. I don't know one general dentist in my area that has his own lab, man. But uh, it's kind of interesting how uh, um, that you have done that. And you see that in cosmetic dentists like Larry Rosenthal in, in Manhattan – he has his own ceramics too. I want to ask you another thing. Um, do you ever think um, CAD CAM will be making your veneers? Or is that just too monolithic for what you're trying to achieve? Have you done any 
CAD CAM veneers on good looking women on the front teeth with high lip lines? Uh, for me, uh, how it's, it's, it's still, we are not there to rely only on CAD CAM. Uh, uh, okay, we're getting better, we, we're having uh, better results. Uh, we are going there. But can I tell myself, okay, I'll uh, stop everything and I'll focus on, on CAD CAM uh, dentistry? I, I think we're not there yet. Are you, using, need, are you using it in the posterior teeth? Are you using CAD CAM in the back or do you still prefer yes. an impression yeah, yeah, of your we, lab man? We do, we do CAD CAM uh, procedures, you know, because it's, uh, again, the affordability is, is, is always a factor, okay? But we still do, uh, we do CAD CAM dentistry more for the posterior teeth. Uh, but still, the main practice is taking impressions and uh, working the, the, the regular way. So if I came to you, if I came to your practice and uh, I broke my first molar, would you recommend for me uh, a CAD CAM or an impression and make a crown? If I, I said I wanted tooth color, what would you do for me? A tooth color uh, uh, for the posterior teeth? Yeah, first molar. Yeah, can yeah, cat, cat cam can do the job. But, but would you nice, do cat yeah, cam or would you take an impression? I, I, yeah, I do cat cam uh, if, if the patient can afford it, yes. Now, for me, in my office, the price is the same, but since I am kind of a hyper dude, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I'm kind of a, uh, I'm a hyper man. And I ask my, if, if we're going to make it in the office, they're going to be there for two hours. And so I okay. say to them, okay, here's the deal. We can do one hour today, and I'll prep the two, take an impression, and you leave the temporary. Or you can say two hours, and I will um, will make it here. There'll be no impression, no temporary, and two hours you'll leave, and you'll be done. And you know what? I mean, you're not going to believe this, but I, and, and, and maybe it's just my area. But in Phoenix, Arizona, four out of five people say, oh, I just want to leave in an hour. I mean, because I was thinking to myself yeah. – if I had to go to the doctor's office and sit in that room for two hours, I'd go crazy. And I think, yes, I think yes, a lot of right humans right. are, and, and they're busy and they got things to do and they're, they're looking at where they need to go and I need to go here and I got to get run this errand and pick up my kid. And I, four out of five people say, no, man, I'd much rather scoot in an hour. And we say, okay. And for us, it's the same price either way. We'll do it here for two hours or we'll do it an hour and then come back in two weeks for 30 minutes. Same price. Yeah, how about yeah, yeah, but uh, you can do the CAD CAM in, in your lab, okay? It's not always in, in clinic. It's, you know, we do restorations, uh, CAD CAM fabricated, but uh, in the lab. And uh, it's, it's nice that we can deliver the restorations the second day. In my region, we rely a lot on, on uh, what we call a dental tourism. We have patients from all over the region, and they need... Uh, fast and excellent results. So this is a solution. Uh, we take regular impressions, and the the technician or we can we can take digital impressions, and the technician can do uh, the uh, the job uh, later. But still, we can deliver the restoration the second day. It's it's, it's still good. So dental tourism usually <laughs> pops up in any country that can deliver the same high quality dentistry. Uh, at a lower price because of a different currency or a different economy. Yes. So what, uh, what countries uh, is this, um, are you attracting dental tourism from? Actually, uh, we have many. Uh, the main, the main uh, countries are from our region, you know, the Gulf region, the North Africa. But still, we have many from Europe, from the States. We have a lot. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of Does Cairo get a lot of dental tourism? I think so. I think so. Uh, for me, I'm closer to uh, Lebanon and Jordan. And yeah, we have a lot of, of, of that. You know, my last name is Faran. And, and there's only 86 families in America with the last name Faran. You know where <laughs> almost all the world's Farans lives is in Lebanon. Did you know that? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and in, uh, in Lebanon, Faran means baker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the funniest story at uh, Phoenix is about once a year, I always have a Lebanese guy, and I always, I'm always, I uh, know this is going to happen. I'll walk in the room, and they, and they look at me strange and go, 
are you Dr. Ferran? And I go, I know <laughs> you're expecting somebody to look like they're from Lebanon. And, uh, but, uh, that's funny. Um, so, so then, um, um, are you doing any, uh, well, what, what I, I don't feel like I should be asking you questions because I've seen your work and you're, uh, you're really uh, a legend in my mind and many other minds. Uh, Ken, Ken, you know Ken Sirota? Yes, exactly. Ken, Ken, yes. Ken Sirota says you're the greatest dentist in the Middle East. I mean, he's a, you know, a huge fan of yours. So uh, I only got you for 10 minutes less. Um, what, what do you think you could tell my viewers? Any, any pointers or any, anything else they could focus on to become better dentists like you? Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, Howard, to give me this chance. Uh, I'm honored to be with you today. Uh, and I would like to, to thank uh, Ken also. He's, uh, he supports us uh, a lot. And uh, he's sort of helping us lately uh, to get into uh, the U.S. And I think uh, we and Dental Town will be working together uh, very, very soon. We are working on this. Uh, uh, as I said uh, before, first of all, we have to believe in ourselves. I'm talking to the, to the fresh graduates. You should believe that you can make the difference. Okay? You should believe in your uh, abilities, how to improve them, how, uh, as you said, uh, working on the, on the things you love. For example, you, it's, it's, it's just weird how, for example, many dentists, they like to do uh, bidodontics. You know, most of us don't like uh, treating kids, and it's just their uh, love, their passion to treat kids. So uh, find the area uh, that you like to work on it, uh, improve yourself, uh, get educated, get the power of knowledge. I don't always say it's the power of knowledge. Once you have the knowledge, uh, you will have the confidence, and uh, you have to believe in yourself, and at the same time, to believe in the teamwork. It's not only uh, a one-man show or it's a one-man job. Once you have those, the knowledge, the uh, believing, and the teamwork, you'll have the success. You know, I have I had four kids. They're all raised now. They're 20, 22, 24, 26. Now I got a three-year-old granddaughter. But uh, if I had to be a pediatric dentist, I would tear up my license and quit. <laughs> And I always thought, well, you know what? That's just an attitude. It's a mindset. And for 28 years, I still will work on kids trying to overcome that. But my resting pulse is like 140. You know, it's usually a, a child. They might not even know English and they're crying and the mom's stressed. And, and it's just when I get done doing a pulpotomy and a chrome steel crown on a three-year-old kid who doesn't speak English – I just want to just walk out the back door and say, you know what? You can take this job and shove it. You know what I mean? I just, I just, I don't know why I can't get over that. So I, uh, if I had to thank God for one thing on earth, it would be for pediatric dentists and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so do you do root canals too? No, uh, actually I have, uh, we have an endodontist. Uh, he's a full practitioner with us. <clears throat> so we, we refer all of the uh, endodontic cases. I want to. I want to. I want to focus on. Uh, I only got you seven more minutes. I want to focus on one other um, area. Does the Baird Institute and you personally do you uh, have a place for mini implants? Yes. Yes. Uh, actually, Professor Marco, Dr. Hassan did many uh, many literature reviews uh, comparing different studies about uh, short implants, and uh, what they found uh, that they have a, a good success, and we actually can rely on short implants. No, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean short. I meant the, uh, the, the diameter, the mini implants being uh, anything less than a three millimeter diameter in Yo, width. Uh, yeah, diameter. The, the, the mini implants. In some cases, yeah, you, have, you have to do them, but uh, they are not a general, uh, general practice, you know. We do, we do uh, mini implants. Uh, I do not, me myself, I do not like the one piece implants, but uh, I do place uh, mini implants that come into two pieces. Underneath a fully edentulous uh, partial or denture? I mean, underneath a, a denture? Yes, yeah, so sometimes uh, underneath a denture, uh, sometimes for lateral incisors, uh, for uh, incisors in the lower mandible. Uh, the mandibles, uh, I, I do place mini implants, but in one condition, if they come in two pieces. 
I don't like the prosthetic outcome of one piece is uh, one piece uh, mini implants. That is interesting. That that is very interesting. Um, so on five minutes uh, to go. Um, any 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 other uh, any other low hanging fruit? How how could how could my listeners around the world uh, learn more about uh, you uh, or the Baird Institute or anything? What um, where should they go? Okay, hopefully soon with Dental Town. Uh, we are uh, available at uh, baird.uk.com. For me, um, uh, my website is uh, Dr. Thamer, uh, D R T H a m e r uh, dot com, and I'm available also on Facebook on Dr. Thamer's Smile Studio. And uh, again, Howard, thank you. You are you're doing great job, and this is a brilliant idea. You know, uh, bridging the gap between dentists, uh, bringing the dentists closer to each other. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to see you, to chat with you, and uh, this is a great opportunity for me. To, uh, to do this with you and hopefully this uh, will bring us uh, more uh, success and uh, collaboration with you in the near future, hopefully soon. Okay, well on that note, thank you so much for giving me an hour of your time. You're so generous and uh, I had a fun time and thank you so much for doing this. Thank, thank you, Howard. Thank you. This is uh, my pleasure. Thank you again. All right, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day.